This, this is a talk of um, two halves. The first part of the talk, I'm going to look at interpretation as a tool in commu communicating an explicit message about sustainability in its various forms. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to look at the practicalities of interpretive green interpretive design, how to design and build exhibitions indoors and outdoors that are going to have a, a smaller carbon footprint. If we, if we want to tread lightly on the earth, our interpretation has to have a, a smaller footprint. And, and I work for a, a creative agency. We plan and design and implement interpretation stuff. And it's the stuff side of things that I'm going to look at in the second part of the presentation. So communicating the sustainability message as part of the sort of the, the context for this, I just want to mention um, a, a growing phenomenon that's now being discussed and measured and recorded um, in many Western countries, something called nature deficit disorder, um, which is a way of describing the sort of growing disconnection between many people in urban communities and the natural world. Um, and I, I think it's fair enough to say that today too many children grow up at arm's length from nature, have very little real contact with nature. And this, this phenomenon is now described with the term nature deficit disorder. And there's even been some research in the United States, for example, into attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and apologies for using some technical terms, um, that, that has shown that, for example, in treating that, that's a behavioral condition that some children have, that treating that condition outdoor walks in natural settings can be as good or better than medication. So I think we can immediately see some relationship here between interpretation, first person connection with nature, and um, in this case, a, a behavioral condition, but also an understanding and empathy with the natural world. Nature interpretation has many forms. Essentially, it's trying to connect people with the natural world to help people hear and understand the language of the earth. That's how I would define nature interpretation. Um, first person or guided experiences are probably the most effective. There'll be plenty of other talks looking at that at the conference, so I'm not going to dwell on that here. Equally, we're hearing a lot about community engagement and how participation and a more democratic approach to uh, meaning making uh, is significant in terms of connecting people with nature. But from my perspective, I think fixed interpretation is also effective. It has a place to play, a role to play both indoors and outdoors at nature reserves and national parks, uh, country parks, but also um, the more kind of mundane, um, everyday natural surroundings in which we live our lives. So uh, in terms of, I'm thinking about the role of visitor centres and encouraging people when they're arriving at a country park like Ness in Northern Ireland to, to better understand the environment that they're going to explore so that they explore that environment with, with a better insight, a better sense of connection as to what that environment what the natural qualities of that place might mean. Another example, Kader Idris National Nature Reserve, um, and the goal of this exhibition was explicitly to help prepare people who come to the mountain nature reserve and, and walk up the mountain trail to the summit to do that in a more um, aware way about the, the, the ecology and the habitats with which they're um, encountering and to try and reduce their impacts on the mountain environment through littering and um, letting dogs off the lead and so on. So there's some specific behavioural objectives uh, for this particular exhibition. And of course, outdoors, we have a range of interpretive media, um, digital experiences, signage, graphic panels, um, sculptural installations, um, audio installations, a whole, the whole gamut of stuff which we as interpreters can use to communicate messages and to help people connect with nature. Um, I think the growing interest in digital media is very interesting. The, the potential benefits of people bringing their own smartphone to um, explore natural sites, it means you don't have to put stuff into the environment, but does it get in the way of actually experiencing nature firsthand? You don't want to go around a nature reserve just looking at your phone the whole time. Um, and I'm still sitting on the fence in terms of whether um, smartphone applications are actually the right answer for um, uh, national parks and nature reserves and protected landscapes. So all these external media are trying to communicate a message, trying to connect people with nature. 
and that connection feeds through into wider awareness about um, uh, a wider empathy with global warming and sustainability. Now, there's another area in which interpretation and the messages that we communicate can be explicitly geared towards um, reducing carbon footprints, for example, when it comes to saving resources. And many nations now have um, national awareness campaigns on carbon reduction and energy efficiency, for example. There are campaigns to sort of reuse, reduce, recycle, whether it's materials or litter. And a lot of these campaigns are expressed through mainstream media, um, TV, promotional campaigns, um, print and publicity. But still, there's no real substitute for direct interpretive experiences. And, and we've been involved with a number of projects where the, the core message has been about something to do with um, energy conservation or resource conservation. Um, this is an example of a, uh, a visitor centre um, commissioned by uh, a water agency um, called Seven Trent Water. It's their most visited site. Um, and their goal was to try and raise awareness about water conservation because it has a public benefit, but they're a private company and they were wanting people, for example, not to throw oils and fats down the sink because that costs them money in terms of the treatment of water as well as being disrespectful to water as a natural resource. So this is an example of an interpretive exhibition. It's not interpreting heritage as such, but it's interpreting the value of water to us all. And this was at a, uh, uh, a reservoir that's a popular recreational destination run by the Water Authority. Um, and this example is, was, a, was, a, was a, a traveling exhibition in, in a bus, uh, a, a, um, a, a, a lorry bus that we converted into something called an energy bus. And this was commissioned by an organization in Oxfordshire that wanted to take the message about um, energy conservation um, to schools and communities throughout the county of Oxfordshire. Uh, and again, it's not about heritage, but we applied all the, the traditional processes of interpretive planning and interpretive design to try and create something w that would be effective for the particular audiences and try and deliver the particular goals. So not necessarily heritage, but it's, it's using the work that we do to, um, to promote a sort of a wider message. And then thinking about traditional skills, again, I think this is an area where um, interpretation has a role to play in helping to, um, to address issues of global warming. I, I think there's a bit of a resurgence of, of the old skills of self-reliance. Certainly within the UK, there's uh, been a great growth in people wanting to have allotments, in poultry keeping, in urban environments, people more interested in traditional craft skills. And there's a sort of a, a development of what I could, would call a new materialism now, not a kind of consumer materialism necessarily, but something about regarding stuff, materials, um, things that we might use and uh, depend on every day um, being more meaningful if they're made in a kind of a craft way. It's the William Morris um, school of thought, have nothing in your home that is not either useful or beautiful. It's a sort of a sense of a new materialism using things that are handmade, that are made to last, that are quality rather than consumer materialism, which is disposable and there's always something new. And that's a new trend. So what does this mean for heritage and interpretation? Well, um, craftspeople, heritage managers and interpreters are increasingly the repositories and communicators of this knowledge. There aren't people generally making a living out of traditional craft skills on their own, but they are now making a living where they engage with tourists or others wanting to encounter those craft skills and learn about them. Uh, and for example, I think there's definitely a trend for open air museums and eco museums to interpret craft skills, not necessarily through traditional, um, well, I'll just show you how to do this, but in a much more sort of actively engaging activity based or training way. And to illustrate that, I just want to mention uh, Acton Scott Historic Working Farm Museum, which is a, a, a site we were involved with um, a few years ago in Shropshire. And they were applying for a Heritage Lottery Fund grant to 
redevelop the museum and improve its, its offer. And we saw the potential it had actually to become a center of training and education in traditional craft skills. And this was the approach we recommended they take in their um, funding application. They adopted that. We helped do all the planning work and wrote their business plan. And they now offer a very wide range of um, training courses in everything from how to make butter, how to make traditional lime render, how to keep poultry, um, traditional farm cooking, um, how to work with heavy horses, thinking about a very specialist audience for that. So they, they've become a very, very active training and education base for traditional craft skills. And that feeds into their wider interpretive programs for general visitors who have a curiosity about this kind of more sustainable, um, possibly um, more wholesome way of life from the past. So that's just a quick run through of some of the ways in which interpretation messages can become part of something we all need to do, which is reduce our carbon footprints. In the second part of the talk, um, I want to concentrate on um, green design. And here I'm going to get into a, a bit more detail um, and some more specifics. So what are the issues here? Well, firstly, I don't think there's any point communicating a message about sustainability if the interpretive designs, all the stuff that we're producing, is not sustainable. I think it's fair to say that museums and cultural and natural heritage organisations are sympathetic to green design, to sustainable exhibition design. The interest is growing in this field and design practices and materials are developing quickly. But if this is something of interest of concern, where can we start to look for some practical guidance? And I'm much more interested in doing things. I don't like just talking and planning. I'm, I'm a doer as well. So I'm really interested in the practicalities of this. Well, I, I think that um, green exhibit certification is, um, is at the moment really the best starting point for um, a thinking and planning and design process to reduce the carbon footprint of our work to make our work inherently more sustainable. And I'm going to run for an example um, that's published by, it's a green exhibit certification scheme published by the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. And this scheme is based on eight key areas of assessment. And I think we need to add some more uh, to that that I'll come on to shortly. So let's look at some of these areas of assessment for their green exhibit certification. Firstly, does the exhibition, this could be indoors, it could be outdoors, it doesn't really matter. Does it use rapidly renewable materials? For example, um, natural resources that grow quickly again in nature. So not depending on slow growing trees, but things like bamboo and coconut palm, wheat straw, rice straw, sunflower stalks or sorghum that grow quickly in nature that might even be a byproduct of other activities like agriculture. For example, you can get um, exhibition boards that are now made out of recycled wheat straw or sorghum and bamboo. And those are going to be inherently more sustainable than materials made out of um, virgin timber. Secondly, resource reuse. Is the exhibit designed with materials that can be reused or, ex or recycled? For example, individual components like a button or a speaker that can be used again in a new exhibition or materials that can be taken down and put into recycling and used again, maybe in a completely different, um, different way, like timber, glass, and steel. So criteria number three, recycled content. Does the exhibit itself use recycled materials? For example, recycled metal, recycled rubber, recycled timber, recycled plastics like acrylic, and Fomex, which is a very commonly used material for printing graphic panels on in the UK. Um, and printing materials onto substrates made, for example, from recycled plastic bottles. Criteria number four, end life assessment. What proportion of the exhibit can be used again? For example, um, is the exhibit designed to a modular format, to modular designs that allow components to be reconfigured easily to a new layout, maybe when you've got some different materials, a different message, um, you can use the stuff again quite easily rather than having to rip it all out and start again from scratch. Criteria number five, 
low emitting materials uh, by emitting um, that means all the, 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 the um, uh, polluting gases that that can be created um, through the material use in exhibitions so does the exhibit use low or zero volatile organic organic compounds again apologies for the technical terms but what we mean is does the exhibit exhibit use for example natural paints that don't have um, hydrocarbons in them and glues that are free from solvents criteria number six certified timber if you're going to use virgin timber is it certified by an organization like the forestry stewardship council fsc which is um very uh, widespread in the UK, certainly. I don't know about other countries, um, but they're prob I, I know it's an international um, certification, yeah. Um, and there are others as well. And I, I think there's an absolute must, there's no excuse whatsoever to use timber that's not FSC certified as an absolute minimum. Criteria number seven, energy conservation. Is the exhibit designed for energy efficiency? For example, using lighting that's compact, fluorescent, LED and fiber optic, using motion sensors to turn interactives on and off when people are, on, are not present, using hand-wound audios, um, AAA energy-rated IT and AV equipment, and just also a, a, a word of warning, be aware about putting too much stuff um, into the virtual world because of the growing energy use of, um, of the internet and the massive um, server farms that are trying to um, maintain all this digital content that we keep churning out are becoming quite a significant source of um, uh, of carbon footprint. And the last in their uh, the last of their criteria in their scheme is regional sourcing. Does the exhibit use materials sourced locally and regionally rather than from a long distance or from abroad? So these are not complex criteria at all. These are all very kind of common sense, fairly simple things to think through and, and to implement. But I would suggest there need to be four additional criteria for a, what I would say is a fully rounded sustainable scheme. Firstly, properly planned. Does the exhibit have an interpretive plan that sets out its themes um, and objectives, identifies the best media and ensures it will achieve its goal? If you haven't got that, there's no point doing anything in the first place. Secondly, a long working life. Is the interpretation built to last? Poor design and cheap materials will significantly reduce the working life of something, even if it's designed with sustainable stuff, if you have to rip it out after two or three years rather than five to ten years. Again, bigger carbon footprint. Um, green contractors. Do all the contractors employed to deliver the scheme have an environmental policy? We do now, image makers, and that's increasingly asked for by our clients, but so do we then ask our suppliers, our fabricators and so on, for their policy on... Um, sustainability and lastly spread the word does the exhibit itself do anything to explain its ecological design so what do we need to do to achieve a green exhibit certification well the Oregon system works on a sliding scale starting with bronze at the most basic level rising to platinum um, and I think with a little thought any and all exhibitions should easily qualify for a bronze award um, and an ultimate goal of platinum really ought to be achievable. Um, I think the most important thing to be aware of if you want to aim high is that your green design goals need to be established right at the beginning of a project. It's not something you can effectively achieve um, by trying to build it in halfway through a project. And also from what we've found from our practical experience that a high environmental rating need actually not cost any more and that's often used as an excuse for well we haven't gone as far as we might have done because things cost more well that isn't necessarily the case so in the last few minutes i'm going to look through a case study um, that we've worked on recently um, there's there's a proposed new eco town in hampshire at a place called white hill and borden and they have an eco station visitor center which opened last autumn which we designed and and it achieved a gold level certificate in this oregon scheme the, the Vista Centre is housed in an old fire station, you can see it on the top right there. And there's a screen grab from their website, because behind there they've built an exhibition house about the new eco town. Um, and the sorts of design solutions and materials choices we made here, for example, the external signage is all made out of recycled timber um, with um, 
uh, natural paints, stencils sprayed onto the surface. Inside where we've got timber structures, they're all either from recycled timber or FSC certified. The, um, the graphic panels are printed onto recycled cardboard and recycled Fomex. And in fact, all the seating in here, which you can't see in these photos, is made out of recycled cardboard. The, the case there, there's a, there's a sword on display, a replica sword on display. That case is made out of recycled acrylic. Um, the centerpiece of the exhibition, it's quite small, is a podium that's constructed primarily from a recycled tractor tire. On that, we've got um, recycled MDF um, used to mount a, a screen that was absolutely the lowest energy rated screen we could find anywhere. It came from Japan rather than the UK, but it had the best AAA rating. You'll see the things dangling from the ceiling, these are little speech bubbles. It's all about communicating the message of what the, um, the eco town means to the people who already live in this area. They were made out of recycled acrylic. Um, we, uh, we even had an exhibit, the only thing in the whole room that was not made out of recycled materials was the exhibit about how to generate electricity where we had to reuse um, a sort of an exercise bike, but we, we turned it into a, a dynamo and an interactive where you pedal away and see if you can make enough electricity to make a cup of tea, which is jolly hard work. Um, so so we've, we've applied as many of these um, practical design techniques as we possibly could to ensure that this exhibition had the lowest possible carbon footprint um, and without it costing any more than the client had already budgeted we got to a gold level award. I'd love one day to achieve a platinum award with another project but I think this illustrates how far you can go now in creating things, creating stuff that has a much lower carbon footprint. So what, what, what are my conclusions from all this thinking about the relationships between what we do as interpreters and this big picture of climate change and global warming? Well, interpretation has a varied contribution to make in tackling global warming. We've looked at messages, we've looked at craft skills. Um, I think the Oregon scheme is a good example, um, but I think also that we need something maybe more specific to our situation in the UK and the European Union um, and I would like to see things like the Oregon scheme used to develop something maybe more specific because some of the criteria there are really would apply much more to the United States than they do to the situation in, in Europe. Um, but I would also finally conclude by saying I think one day um, all exhibitions will be made in this way. Thank you. <laughs>